What's up YouTube, I'm Guy. Today on the channel we're going to be looking at two watches that are often compared to one another that are at extremely different price points. One a little bit more of an affordable entry level watch, one a multi thousand dollar luxury watch. Before we get into it though, a quick thanks to the viewer of the channel that loaned me this watch. They actually sent this in quite a long time ago. I filmed most of the footage, but I was holding off on posting this video until I finished my full feature length Omega Speedmaster review. I did that review a couple weeks ago, now I'm ready to roll this video out today. So today we're looking at two watches, the Omega Speedmaster Moon Watch and of course the Bulova Lunar Pilot. These watches get compared to one another quite frequently for a number of reasons. Number one, obviously their connection to NASA, to space missions, to lunar landings, to everything that has to do with outer space. That is their biggest connection to one another and why they are often compared to each other. But there's a number of other reasons as well. Number two is probably because stylistically, aesthetically, they're quite similar. And to go hand in hand with that, number three, they're extremely, drastically different price points. A lot of people can't or don't want to spend the kind of money that an Omega Speedmaster commands and they're looking for a more aff affordable alternative. Absolutely, the Bulova Lunar Pilot is a, a pretty good alternative to the Speedmaster if you're willing to make a handful of sacrifices. So let's jump over to the tabletop, let's look at these two watches, let's talk about them, and then we'll come back over here for some of my final thoughts. All right, guys, here we have it. Two watches that are vastly different in terms of price point, in terms of the underlying technology that powers these watches, but that are very often compared to one another. Of course, on the left, we have the Omega Speedmaster Professional Moon Watch, and on the right, we have the Bulova Lunar Pilot Chronograph, reference 96B251. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the... 96B258. That would be the version of this bull of a watch here on the right on a metal bracelet. It would be a slightly better comparison considering that the Omega does come on a metal bracelet, but I'm still happy to have access to this Bulova uh, 251 reference number because really what we're concerned about is the head of the watch, primarily. The fact that this one comes on a leather strap, not a big deal. That said, let's talk about the Bulova first a little bit. I'll go over the specifications. Not going to do an entire in-depth review. I think what most of you guys want to see is the comparison between these two watches. So before we get started with the side-by-side -side comparison, I will give you some basic specs and information about this Bulova Lunar Pilot Chronograph. Overall dimensions on this watch, 45 millimeters in case diameter, not inclusive of the crown or the chronograph pushers. We have a 20 millimeter lug width where the strap attaches to the case, a thickness that comes in at 13 and one half millimeters, and a lug to lug width from one extremity of the case to the other from tip to tip, or what I historically like to call a watch's wingspan of 53 millimeters on my calipers. Overall, relatively large sized case. The case itself is in 316L stainless steel, and it's entirely in a satin bead blasted finish. It's very smooth. It is actually quite nice. We also have a sapphire crystal covering the dial. Inside of that sapphire crystal is the tachometer scale you can see running on the outer periphery of the dial. We'll compare that to the tachometer scale on the Omega here in a little bit. Now we do get 50 meters of water resistance on this watch, but that's not an uh, incredibly great amount of water resistance, so by no means is this a dive watch. Um, black leather strap, as you can see here, and we will talk about the black leather strap in a moment. And uh, finally, this runs on Bulova's 262 kilohertz quartz movement. Now, I did a video a while back where I talked about the Bulova Precisionist, which is not a chronograph, but nevertheless, it is a pretty nice high accuracy quartz Bulova watch that runs a very similar 262 kilohertz quartz movement. So I'm not gonna go into great depth or detail about this quartz movement, 
Because that's been covered in the past in previous videos, I encourage you to go into my library and check that out if you're interested. Since these two watches are vastly different in terms of their strap system, of course the Bulova having this black leather strap and the Omega having a stainless steel bracelet, I'm not going to compare them, but I will give you my impressions of the leather strap on this Bulova before we get into that comparison, so as to kind of cover it as part of the Bulova review. The strap itself, the leather, is very nice. If we look at it up close here and get it in some good light, it almost has sort of like this carbon fiber style pattern, uh, probably embossed into the leather. It is nice. Speaking of embossing or uh, bolstering, this strap is bolstered and it is fairly thick. I'm not a huge fan of overly thick or overly bolstered straps. If you give it a squeeze, you can feel that, yeah, it is, there's definitely some padding inside of there. So it is a thick strap. Still a nice strap though, don't get me wrong. That's just uh, not my preference. The only real downside about the strap for me is the buckle. I think that it's it's a very big buckle. It's kind of a, uh, I don't know, a bar style buckle with a, you know, a tang style pin. We do have two keepers. Uh, yeah, it's just a, it's a little strange how large the buckle is on this. Without some reference, maybe it'll be hard to see. So here's just a random strap that I had sitting on my uh, desktop here, and you can see how much larger this Bulova buckle on the left is to this random Barton strap. The, the Barton strap has a little bit more meat to it, it's a little bit thicker, but the overall size and scale of it is somewhat smaller, considering they're both 20 millimeter straps. Yeah, it's um, kind of curious why they went with this big, large style buckle on the Bulova. On the wrist, this strap is comfortable, it feels nice. The underside of the strap is well done. I have really very minimal complaints about it, but I would probably prefer, as I generally do, a metal bracelet to a leather strap. Uh, you know, that's just me. But if you want to save a little bit of money between this and the version that comes on the bracelet and you do enjoy leather straps, particularly uh, a thick padded or bolstered leather strap, definitely give this one a look. I don't have any major complaints with the overall quality. So what are we here for today? Well, obviously it is to compare these two watches. On the left, again, the Omega Speedmaster Professional Moonwatch. On the right, the Bulova Lunar Pilot Chronograph. What do I think about these two watches? Well, first things first, the obvious size differences. The Bulova watch here on the right is bigger. Substantially bigger? No, not substantially bigger, but it is noticeably bigger. Case diameter of 45 millimeters on the Bulova, 42 millimeters on the Omega on the left. Uh, yeah, three millimeters in difference, and when you also factor in the pushers that are kind of large on the Bulova as well, yeah, it does feel like it is quite a bit more of a round case. Lug widths are the same at 20 millimeters where the straps connect, and surprisingly the thicknesses aren't that much different either. The Bulova is 13.5 millimeters thick, while the Omega Speedmaster is 14.5 millimeters thick. That is to say that for a quartz watch, this Bulova is pretty darn thick. If I'm not, uh, you know, if I'm being honest, I would suspect or would have expected, I guess I should say, a thinner presentation or profile on a quartz-based chronograph. But yeah, they aren't substantially different in terms of thickness. The big difference for me between these two watches is the lug-to-lug -lug width from one tip of the case to the other, the watch's wingspan. Let me go and hold this watch in profile. Of course, what we're talking about is from this tip to this tip here, 43 millimeters on the Bulova. By comparison, the Omega Speedmaster is only 48 millimeters from uh, lug to lug, or the watch's wingspan. That's a pretty big difference, 48 to 53, 5 millimeters. If you are slender wristed or just prefer smaller watches, the Omega Speedmaster is going to feel a lot smaller explicitly because of that wingspan. It will fit a much wider array of wrist sizes. So definitely keep that in mind. Uh, moving along though, let's talk about the, the cases. Now the case on the Bulova is a very smooth, bead blasted, satiny finish. Not brushed, very much a very soft satin bead blast finish. The bezel is 
just sort of like a step up, and then it's basically almost entirely crystal if you're looking at it face down like this, but also bead blasted or, or satin finished. The pushers on the case are a little curious to me. They're sort of these wing-shaped pushers, and if we look at them in profile here, you can see they're, they're a little thick, but top down, yeah, it just looks like these little kind of wing chunks of, of metal sticking out from the side of the case. The crown, nicely done, no problems there. I don't love the aesthetic of these pushers, but I do like the overall finish of the case. That's not to say that I hate the aesthetic of the pushers, and using the pushers is quite usable. They are easy to actuate or interface with, so I don't have any major complaints about the functionality. Just stylistically, the pushers do look interesting, to say the least. On the other hand, the case and the pushers of the Omega, I mean, you know, it is very, very much an Omega watch. We have the twisted or lyre style lug profile, high polished surfaces on these bevels here with a nice satin brushed finish on the flanks of the case. Very nicely done. Of course, the, considering the price difference, there should be a huge disparity in the terms of the overall fit and finish on these two watches. The pushers though on the Omega, I much prefer the style of piston or plunger style pusher. Equally easy to operate or interface with, uh, but overall aesthetically the balance of the design, I just think that this type of pusher looks better. And the, the, the crown is more or less the same on these two watches. There's not a huge difference. The crown on the Bulova perhaps stands off the edge of the case a little bit more. And considering you don't have to hand wind this quartz movement, whereas with the mechanical movement on the Omega, you do have to hand wind. It would actually be preferable if the, the crown on the Omega stood off the side of the case a little bit more, like this Bulova. Speaking of the cases, here's the case back of the Omega. We have the Speedmaster with the Omega logo in the dead center, and then a little bit of text on the outer edge there, flight qualified by NASA for all manned space missions, the first watch worn on the moon, and then at the lower edge it says professional moon watch. Um, yeah, I don't really care about all of that on the back of the watch personally, but there it is. There's a similar presentation on the back of the Bulova, as you can see, and yes, there is still a case back sticker there. I'm not going to remove that in case the owner wants to retain that sticker, but you can see there's Apollo 15, some dates and other information about that particular mission that uh, apparently this watch accompanied an astronaut to space. These watches are compared to one another for their obvious visual similarities. Their black dials, their tri-compact style chronograph layout, their pencil style hands in white, similar markings on the dial for the hour and minute markers, a tachymetric scale. At a quick glance, you can see that there are a lot of visual similarities between these two watches. But when you drill in a little bit closer, the differences start to become fairly apparent. On the Speedmaster's dial, the watch on the left, we have a active running seconds subdial at the 9 o'clock position. But you can see that on the Bulova watch, the active running seconds subdial is at the 6 o'clock position. A little bit of a deviation in similarity between the two. They also have a different layout for the text on those subdials. They're functionally the same though. They do the same thing. Now of course the Bulova is a quartz driven watch and the Speedmaster is a mechanical watch, so you'll notice that the tick of the second's hand or the movement of that hand, it's not quite the same. We expect that going into this, and obviously the prices reflect the differences in the technology behind these watches. Nevertheless, that subdial does differ. Now there's two other subdials on both of these watches. We have on the Speedmaster, a 30-minute totalizer at the 3 o'clock position and a 12-hour totalizer at the 6 o'clock position. So while we're using our chronograph, we can keep count of elapsed time in 30-minute increments on this subdial, and every hour the 6 o'clock subdial will increment up as well. Very different on the Bulova. This is one of my dislikes about the Bulova. I will set the Speedmaster down to illustrate this a little bit more clearly. On this watch, our subdials are a 60 minute totalizer at the 9 o'clock position 
and a one-tenth of a second subdial at the three o'clock position. I find having a one-tenth second subdial or totalizer to be honestly relatively useless. Let me show you how it works. By pushing the top pusher, we start the chronograph, and you can see that the central seconds hand starts moving, but this small tenth of a second subdial starts spinning like crazy as well. As we begin to approach the 30 second mark of our first minute, you'll see that this tenth of a second subdial halts, yet our central seconds hand continues to count elapsed time. There is, though, in the background, tenth of second increments still keeping track, so that when we actually pause our chronograph, that subdial jumps to, in this case, nine tenths of a second. So we could see that roughly, if I see this correctly, 45 and nine tenths of a second have elapsed. Here's the thing. I don't ever need to know how many tenths of a second elapse. That is not a particularly useful feature for me. And we'll go ahead and we'll restart it. And you can see that it continues to count again in tenths of a second, but that will halt after 30 seconds. Problem number two with this watch is the 60 minute totalizer. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more closely. Now, as you can see, time has continued to elapse and our 60 minute totalizer is incremented over to what looks like one minute. So we could say that one minute and 37, 38, 39, and now 40 seconds has elapsed as we look at that central seconds hand. But I'm not 100% sure that the 60 minute totalizer says one minute. My camera is very much zoomed in here and I can barely read that uh, the scale or the graduations on that subdial. What I'm getting at is that a 60 minute subdial or a 60 minute scale on a chronograph is relatively useless to me. I don't have the best vision in the world. I do wear eyeglasses, but I don't need reading glasses. And yet still, I cannot read chronographs that use a 60 minute totalizer. I'm not a fan of that layout. On the other hand, the layout on the Omega Speedmaster much better. First of all, let's get it running, a click of the top pusher, and we get the current seconds hand rolling. Now, at the three o'clock position of the dial on the Speedmaster, we have a 30 minute totalizer. Let's zoom in here a little bit more close. Even with my relatively poor eyesight, I can see that a minute has not yet elapsed on that 30 minute totalizer. I look down and I see that we have 55, 56, 57 seconds, and right about now it's gonna tick over to one minute and one seconds, two seconds, three seconds, and so on. I can see that with my naked eye, with no magnification, without any problems, so, so long as there's sufficient lighting in my surroundings. I find a 30 minute totalizer subdial to be much more usable, much more legible. Now, another upside, and it's somewhat obfuscated by the hour hand, is the 12 hour totalizer or subdial. So, unlike the Bulova, this watch is capable of keeping track of up to 12 hours of elapsed time. The Bulova only has a 60 minute subdial, so we're only going to be able to track elapsed time for roughly one hour on that watch. All of those technical differences aside, these watch dials do look very similar. The black, the tri-compacts layout of the subdials, the seconds, minutes, and hours hands all being of a stark white contrasting pencil style, very legible. Yeah, you can see that the similarities here most certainly are striking. The fact that they both have a little bit of that moon watch or space aviation history also probably brings in a lot of the comparisons, but they are very different animals. Number one, the Bulova does have a date complication down at right between the four and five o'clock position, and we have no date on the Omega watch. The date complication on the Bulova is well done. It's not intrusive, it's legible enough, yet, doesn't stand out so much that I bet a lot of you guys didn't even notice that that date complication was present there down at the bottom right hand side of the dial. Don't feel bad if you missed it over the course of this entire video so far. At first I missed it as well. But uh, yeah, that's one difference between these two watches. Another difference is the bezel. And while a tachymetric scale or a tachymeter bezel is all but useless to me, they're sort of 
does exist an aesthetic appeal to having that bezel on these watches. They are very much different though. The tachymetric scale on the Speedmaster, the watch on the left, is a bezel insert exterior of the crystal. On the other hand, on the Bulova, the crystal does cover the tachymeter scale. Which is better? Well, aesthetically or stylistically, I prefer the look of the tachyme tach tachymeter scale on the Omega, but in terms of overall durability and longevity, I suppose having it underneath that crystal means that it will be protected. We can be sure that over time, the painted graduations or markers on our scale on the bezel of the Omega will get scratched up over time. It will get damaged over time. It will probably fade due to exposure to the sun and UV light over time. Which do you prefer? Personal, stylistic choices, um, you know, probably six of one, half a dozen of, of, of the other for a lot of people. But if I had to choose which style I like better, I am going with the watch on the left. So the dial on the Omega Speedmaster, very simple, very straightforward, no nonsense. I think that it's extremely handsome. I think it's very well designed and laid out. I do love this presentation, but there's nothing overly luxurious or extremely impressive about it. That said, it's based on a design from the late 1950s, and it is, at its heart, a tool watch from that era. So it is what we should expect. On the other hand, the overall design of the Bulova dial is a little bit more dressed up. It looks a little bit more modern. The hour markers are very nicely done appliques. The total dial has more depth and dimension. Overall, I'm not going to say it's done better. I'm going to say that it is certainly a little bit more modern, though. And again, being as how this watch was based on designs from the 1970s, but I think probably not true to the era, at least not as true to the era as the Speedmaster was, I don't have a problem with the fact that they have, you know, done things like or excuse me, applied markers to the dial, things of that nature. It looks nice. It's a very good presentation in its own right. I had said I was going to let you know how do these watches wear on the wrist. I'm going to throw the Speedmaster on my wrist first, show it to you on my six and three quarter inch wrist, and then we will compare with the Bulova. The Omega Speedmaster Professional on my six and three quarter inch wrist fits just fine. It does probably border or start to flirt with what I am comfortable as far as overall size and scale, but I don't have any problems with it. I certainly would not want to go any larger than this, and that's probably the main hurdle with this Bulova watch. As you can see here, the lugs from tip to tip aren't really challenging the outermost extremities of my wrist. It doesn't look like it's overhanging. It just looks like a relatively large watch on me. On the other hand, the Bulova is a little bit of a monster on my wrist. You can see that that 53 millimeter lug to lug is absolutely at the outer limits of what would be considered acceptable for my wrist probably by most people, and frankly, I would say that it's too big for my wrist. The, the, the diameter is not really the problem. It is this wingspan from tip to tip that overall makes this watch not work on my wrist. In terms of style and presentation, the Speedmaster is my preferred watch. In terms of overall quality, fit and finish, yeah, it is also better, but it ought to be for more than 10 times the price of this Bulova. However, the Bulova Lunar Pilot Chronograph is quite a nice watch and it is a surprise at roughly $325 on the strap, maybe $400 to $425 on the bracelet. I would definitely consider this if A, you like the large watch, or B, you have a larger wrist that can go with this watch. I mean, some people with smaller wrists, they, they like larger watches. So, you know, go with what uh, makes you comfortable. If for some reason you decide I don't want to spend the kind of money that a Speedmaster commands, yeah, give this Bulova a hard look. All right, guys, there you have it. The Omega Speedmaster Moonwatch and, of course, the Bulova Lunar Pilot. Well, what do I think? Obviously, first things first. The Omega Speedmaster is a significantly nicer watch. It's better made. It is overall superior in almost every way. You know, I can't say every way because uh, we could talk accuracy and, of course, a high 
precision quartz movement is going to be more accurate. The Bulova would win there. But in terms of the overall build quality, fit and finish, all of that, Omega has it in spades. Now that's not to say that the Bulova Lunar Pilot is a bad watch, and when we talk about price, it's actually a really nice watch. Compared to the Speedmaster, it has a lot of things going for it when we think about that disparity, that tremendous disparity in price. The Bull of a Lunar Pilot is roughly a $500 watch, plus or minus, depending on where you buy it. And of course, the Omega Speedmaster has uh, a manufacturer-suggested retail price of north of $5,000. Now, you, you could get both of these watches for significantly less than those prices if you shop around. Gray market, uh, even discounts from authorized dealers, and, and not to mention secondhand. But we'll start there uh, for the point of comparison of these two watches vis-a-vis -vis price. For the price, the Bull of a Lunar Pilot has a ton going for it. It's a very, very nicely made watch, and I'm highly impressed with it. If you're in the market for a chronograph that has the style and aesthetic of a Speedmaster, and you can take the bigger size of the Bull of a Lunar Pilot, absolutely give this watch a long, hard look. Now that's my point of contention with the Bull of a Lunar Pilot. It's just way too big. It is 45 millimeters in diameter, which isn't the deal breaker for me so much as it is that wingspan of 53 millimeters. That is bordering on, on massive, if I'm being honest. Uh, you could see on my wrist it was just barely wearable, but I wouldn't be comfortable with it. Uh, you know, it, it, it would feel a little bit awkward to me personally. Now there's plenty of guys out there that like a larger watch, and for you guys, that A, like a larger watch, or B, have a larger wrist and need a larger watch, it could be absolutely perfect. But I think for most people that have average or smaller sized wrists, that is going to be the big challenge. Now there are some small aesthetic things that I don't prefer with the Bulova Lunar Pilot in terms of the functionality of the chronograph and specifically those sub-dials on the main dial, the 60-minute totalizer or, or register, I definitely don't prefer that. That tenth of a second counter is, I want to say, all but useless. I know some people are going to probably argue that measuring tenths of seconds is not useless. For me, it personally is. It's not something that I want on the watch. The execution of the functionality of a chronograph is done better by the Omega, by a wide margin, in my opinion. But... That's one of those kind of, you know, small sacrifices you would have to make if you decide I want to save a ton of money and, you know, get a cool watch that's not the Omega. All right, guys, that's going to wrap this video up for today. I hope you enjoyed it. And a big thanks to the viewer that loaned me this watch a while ago. I, I sent it back ages ago. And, uh, you know, despite that, I apologize that it took me so long to actually produce and publish this video. I just needed to get that Speedmaster video done first. And, you know, everything is finally coming together. Uh, again, I do appreciate the generosity and for loaning me this watch, though, very, very much. If you guys would like to help me out and support my channel and what I'm doing here, there's a number of ways that you can do that. As always, they are listed in the description of this and every video that I do. Down there, you'll find links to my social media accounts, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, as well as a link to my Facebook group, the Just Bluefish Watch Club. I highly encourage you to join that Facebook group if you want to chat watches with me and other fans of the Just Bluefish channel. If you'd like to help support me financially and keep these videos coming, uh, my Patreon link, that is down there as well. A big thanks to the guys guys that have been over there giving me small donations on a monthly basis on Patreon. I greatly appreciate that support, and I would greatly appreciate support from anyone else out there that, uh, yeah, they like what I'm doing and they'd like to help me out. Finally, if you'd like to help me out financially, there's another way that you can do that just by shopping on Amazon. If you like something I reviewed and you're thinking about buying it, or frankly anything else for that matter, click on my Amazon affiliate link, and uh, yeah, I get a small commission with every single transaction. Those commissions most certainly add up, and a big thanks to everyone that has been using my Amazon affiliate link. I appreciate it very much. Well, that's going to wrap this video for today. So until the next one, I'll sign off and say bye now.